Alright, so today we are here to talk about The House of the Scorpion. Now this one, I actually remember seeing it around when I was a kid. I n never picked it up, but I did hear about it. And a couple people in my comments kept asking me to review it, to talk about it in some way, so I figured why not? I checked it out, and uh, I think I think it's good. I'm not really in the target audience, but I think it's good. This is the introduction song. It's not very good, but it's not too long. This will probably be a brief review because I don't have that much to say. Like, I'll have a brief non-spoiler section and then a brief spoiler section because, I mean, in both cases, there's just not that much to add. Like, this isn't a particularly long book, and it is for kids. So, you know, like, e even though I could probably go into more depth on certain criticisms I have, it's for kids. Like, so what, what would be the point? You know, I I think this is a good book. I think it's well put together and everything. It didn't really grab me, but that's because I'm really not part of the target audience. Like, if you were to take a book with the same setup and make it for, uh, you know, an older audience, I'm, I might have liked it more. But as it stands now, I think, yeah, this would be good for kids. So the setup for this book is admittedly kind of weird, but it's also pretty cool. Basically, this is sometime far in the future. They never specify exactly when. At first I thought it was relatively close in the future, but then based on some of the technology and some of the events they reference and stuff, I think it's over a hundred years in the future. And essentially, a big chunk of northern Mexico and the southern United States has been um, taken and it's formed its own country, which was run by drug lords who just, you know, sell opium and stuff like that. And they... Well, actually, the country is literally just called Opium. It took me a while before I realized that, which is kind of a dumb name, but whatever, whatever, not a big deal. And the story follows this kid named Mateo, or Matt as he's usually referred to as, who is a clone of the, essentially, the king of Opium. Like, uh, he, he's usually just referred to as El Patron. And Matt, it, it kind of follows Matt throughout his entire childhood. Like, it starts off when he's, like, six years old, and it shows a big chunk of, uh, his life there, where he, like, meets some friends and stuff, and then it just skips forward a few years, and then it shows a big chunk like that, and so on and so forth until we get to 14, and that's where the, maybe the second half of the book, I think, is. Probably the biggest issue with the book is that that's kind of all there is here. Like, there isn't much of an overarching story up until eh, maybe two-thirds through. Because around two-thirds through, we get to this point where I actually thought this was supposed to be the climax because a whole bunch of crazy stuff happens, and then uh, Matt has to go off and do more stuff. I'm not going to get into it in the non-spoiler section. And as I was listening to it, because I, I did this one on the audiobook, as I was listening to it, I was thinking, okay, this is actually going to be a pretty good cliffhanger. And then I looked, and I saw there were still several hours left. And then the next couple hours are just... Matt doing other stuff, and then we get to the real climax. And admittedly, that last third uh, does have, like, an actual story and is doing its own thing and everything. It just feels a little odd because we spent most of the book in this one location, learning about these characters and everything, and then we toss most of that aside. So that was a little odd. Uh, but other than that, yeah, this book is mostly just kind of showing Matt live his life in this uh, area which he slowly starts to discover is extremely dystopic like it it's a very nasty place to live which you know shouldn't surprise you that much considering that again it is a country literally founded by drug dealers and it's run by drug lords who make all their money from opium and stuff so yeah it's not that weird that it would be uh, kind of a nasty place to live but even beyond that there is a lot of unpleasant stuff like the way border patrol deals with people who are fleeing uh, either from the U.S. to Mexico or Mexico to the U.S. Actually, actually, Mexico is no longer called Mexico in this. Uh, it's implied that they've had a bunch of, like, revolutions and stuff over the years, and now their name is Aztlan, which, brief aside, that's a weird name to choose because um, Aztlan is actually where the word Aztec comes from because um, the people who we refer to as Aztecs, uh, they were... Uh, how do I put this? They, they were kind of an alliance of several different city-states which went out and conquered that whole empire, right? Um, but the tribe that ran Tenochtitlan, which was the, the main city-state which kind of ran everything, 
Uh, they were the Mexica tribe, which is actually where the name Mexico comes from. And before they founded Tenochtitlan, they were a nomadic tribe which wandered around, and they claimed to be from uh, this place called Aztlan, which was somewhere to the north. Now, we don't know precisely where uh, Aztlan is in the world, you know, it's probably somewhere in northern Mexico or the U.S., but the thing is, if northern Mexico was, was gone, then Aztlan is no longer part of Mexico, it, at least I think it wouldn't be, so having that name is odd to me, and admittedly that's a very small detail, but it did irk me just a bit. Overall though, uh, I like Matt as a character. You know, I like that we can see him as a kid when his personality hasn't really fully formed yet, and then we get to see him grow up and change over the course of the book. Like, I once heard a metaphor about uh, how people uh, change as they grow up. It's like, as you're, when you're a kid, that's your skeleton of your personality. So, like, the basic shape is there and everything, uh, but as the years go on, all the muscles and organs and skin and everything get added on, and that fits really well for Matt, because as a kid, his personality is not super well formed, but as he gets older, you can definitely see, oh yeah, he's changing, but this is still the same guy underneath it all. And I thought that was pretty neat. He's not, like, the most compelling character either. In fact, he's kind of dumb at times. He's a little slow on the uptake. Like, nothing that's really annoying or that I couldn't deal with, but it, I, I'd be lying if I said it didn't irk me a little bit. Like, when he finds out the real reason why he was cloned, it, it seemed obvious to me the whole time. Like, it just, um... I, I, it shouldn't have been surprising to him, and it's the book treats it as this massive plot twist, which I thought was kind of dumb, but, you know, really not that big a deal. And if I was a kid reading it, then maybe it wouldn't have bothered me at all. As for the other characters, they're all kind of fine. You know, the only one I, I really liked was Matt's bodyguard, Tamlin, who is this, you know, this Scottish dude who is just kind of uneducated, but he's not stupid, and he's just a very nice friend to Matt throughout all this, like, because, again, Matt's in this nasty uh, setting where everyone kind of hates him, and Tamlin actually comes along and is his friend. Although, I will say that he's supposed to be Scottish, but the audiobook's narrator makes him sound more Irish, which is a little annoying, but... Again, not a huge issue. Like, I, I've been saying that a lot, I know, but that's the thing. There's a lot of stuff in here which is a little irksome and really prevents this book from rising to being a great book, I think, but it, it's not that big a deal overall. Like I said, I think it's good, and if I were a kid, maybe a lot of these things wouldn't bother me at all. And, you know, I don't have a whole lot else to add in the non-spoiler section. What I will say is that House of the Scorpion, uh, it is an interesting look at a future world uh, with a somewhat interesting main character who I, I think he's going to get much more development in the sequels and stuff because he certainly changes a bunch in the last third of this book. Uh, and I think if you're a younger person or you're looking for a gift for a younger person, they probably like this one a lot. Uh, if you're an adult, I don't know if it'll blow your mind, but there's some good stuff in here, and if that setup sounds neat to you, then go ahead and check it out. Okay, now for spoilers. So, basically El Patron cloned himself and made Matt so that he could have a spare set of organs around, so that when he needs a new liver or something, he can just take Matt's, and... That seemed super obvious to me from the get-go. Like, it, it seemed like, yes, that he's just for spare parts. It's Not only is it mentioned that he's done this multiple times in the past, but it's kind of implied that that's what he's been doing throughout the whole book. And so when Matt can't figure it out, it seems a little... I, I don't know, it seems like he needed to have it pressed right in his face before he realized that's what was going on, which made Matt seem kind of stupid. Uh, not extremely stupid, but kind of stupid. Uh, but then it turns out that uh, Matt's mother, or uh, the woman who raised him at least, uh, she had kind of sort of poisoned him so that his organs would be no good for El Patron. Like, he still can live. You know, obviously she didn't want to kill Matt, but his, his organs can't be used anymore. So El Patron dies, and Matt has to flee, and 
He's supposed to run off and find one of his friends in Aztlan, you know, in Mexico somewhere. But he winds up getting caught by... caught up, basically, and he goes to what is essentially an orphanage. Now, at this point, we learn some more about Aztlan and how they're also kind of an unpleasant dystopia. And without going into too much detail, it's basically a sort of collectivist society, it seems, and like, no one's allowed to accumulate wealth for themselves and such. Like, I, I don't mind that they're putting that in there, it's just handled with all the subtlety of Ayn Rand, so, you know, that's kind of stupid, but, you know, Matt realizes this place kind of sucks too, and at that point, this book becomes kind of more of a traditional kid story, because I don't know what you would call this genre, but there are a lot of books that I read as a kid, and I'm sure a lot of you can think of some too, where kids are just stuck in some sort of like evil school or evil location or something and they have to escape. Like, uh, the most recent example I can think of is an anime called The Promised Neverland, which is uh, basically the same idea. Uh, which, that one is actually, I think, aimed at more of an older audience though. Uh, because they have like dead bodies and stuff that maybe kids shouldn't be seeing. But, yeah, I remember reading a lot of books with, like, similar setups. You know, oh, we're at an evil orphanage, so let's escape the orphanage. Or we're at an evil boarding school, let's escape, escape the evil boarding school. You know, that sort of thing. And I, at that point, like I said, is is more of a traditional kid's story, so I was a lot less interested for the last couple hours of this book. Uh, but, eventually, you know, Matt and some of his new friends, who were just kind of introduced, and none of whom are that interesting, I don't think, uh, they escape with him, and then he meets up with some people, and they're like, Hey, you're El Patron's clone, so that means you can go into Opium. Remember, the country is called Opium. Still kind of a dumb name. Uh, you can go in there and tell us what's going on, because they've been on lockdown for several months now, ever since El Patron died. And then they, he goes there, and it turns out the people who were supposed to take over after El Patron died have also been killed, because uh, El Patron basically didn't want anyone to outlive him, so he kind of just killed all of them, and he's like, fuck it, let it fall into chaos, I don't care anymore. Which is kind of interesting, actually. I think, I kind of wish El Patron had stick, stuck around, because I think he'd be a really interesting villain for this series, because he's, you know, he's evil. He's straight up evil, but you can kind of see where he's coming from, and he has a neat backstory, and he does have a weird sort of charisma about him, so I kind of wish he'd stuck, he would have stuck around. But either way, Long story short, Matt realizes, okay, I'm basically the only one that can that can uh, conceivably have a claim to this place because yeah, I don't know how that really works, actually. It's, it's not like it's a monarchy where there's a law set up for him to take over, I don't think. But, all right, whatever. Basically, he takes over as the king of opium, and he's like, okay, I'm just going to dismantle El Patron's drug empire. And then that's kind of where it ends. It's... Uh, you know, setting it up for sequels. And while I do think that's an okay ending, I also feel that it makes this whole book feel almost like a prologue. Like, you know, th this is just the setup for a bigger story, which is not inherently a bad thing, but looking back at this and realizing that the plot didn't have much focus or direction, it makes me realize, man, a lot of that time was kind of wasted. And I feel like maybe uh, everything with El Patron up to Matt taking over could have been handled in like half of the time it was and then the second half of the book would be Matt in charge of everything and getting it over his head and I, I don't know what happens in the sequels but like whatever happens there could continue happening and eh, I don't know I just I just feel like the plot could have been structured a bit better there but you know not the end of the world overall like I said before if that sounds interesting to you go ahead and give it a shot. I can't speak to the sequels, but I get the feeling that they're probably a bit better than this one, if only because they have more direction to them. All right, this is the part where I have to read off patron names. So uh, thanks to all of you guys, and thanks especially to Apo Savalainen, Olivia Rayan, Ava Toomer, Brother Santodis, Christopher Quinten, Deanna Dahim, Ambis, Emily Miller, Joel, Cardcat Kitsune, Liza Rudakova, Madison Lewis Bennett, Micaphone, Sad Mardigan, Tobacco Crow, Tom Beanie, Vacuous Silas, Ve Victus, and of course, Yakov Merkin. All of you guys, you, you are all seriously 
just the best. Just just the bestest, best people ever. Without you, I would not be able to do this. And if you want to get your name on here, then donate to my Patreon page. Why not? A anything helps. A dollar a month, that's, that's more than most of you will ever give me. But, you know, it's more than my father ever gave me, certainly. So, you know, if... Uh, if you want to help, then, you know, get your name on here and, uh, you know, do, do stuff. Thanks. Bye.